Hi everyone. Welcome to another week of Gardens and Grub, all things food. And uh, I would like to welcome you. And uh, if you'd like to ask, uh, ask a question, make sure to write in the chat box or you can raise your hand on Zoom or you can communicate through. Uh, so I had a very interesting uh, time very early in the morning at the grocery store. And I saw this and I had to bring it to you, even though it isn't the freshest one I've ever seen. I thought, you know, this is the day to do this particular family. So this is a Romanesca. There's a little piece that's broken off there. But look at, isn't that so interesting? The parts that are the smallest, as they get bigger, they're the same. This is called a fractal pattern. So let me show you that word so you can look it up. It's actually math. Fractal. We're not going to get into too deep of what this means because there's Fibonacci numbers, uh, golden ratios. You know, give it a web search and read about it. But a fractal, a very simple way to describe this is that if you look at very closely, the tiniest unit of this looks like the whole thing. So it, it's like it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the Fibonacci number is actually the sort of um, curled around spiral of this. It's a logarithmic spiral. So check it out. These tend to be pretty pricey because they have a limited, uh, they have a limited market. Uh, they're usually, usually find them in the fancy stores. You're not gonna find this at like a discount grocery store usually. Um, but they're definitely worth it because they are, th this vegetable is crisp like a cauliflower, but tastes a little bit more like broccoli. It's not as pungent, it's kind of nutty. Um, and you would put this in any recipe that you would use broccoli or cauliflower. So the family of broccoli and cauliflower are the brassicas. So brassica oleracea. This is the plant species name of Romanesca, but it's also the plant name for broccoli, cauliflower. So if these two had a baby, they would make a Romanesca, basically. It's like a perfect cross between broccoli and cauliflower. So uh, the Brassica family is very diverse, um, sort of the European um, cultivars are the oleraceae. There's also brassica rapa. There's a few different other kinds of brassicas. But all the brassicas are, are included are the cabbage family, the mustards, things like that. Um, canola, uh, those are all brassicas. Um, so another thing I wanted to show you, this is kind of fun. These are broccolini. So you got broccoli and you got broccolini. Now, sometimes people think that, you know, this grows in one big head. And if you chop this off, that same plant will start to put off little bits of broccoli. Those, are, the stems are only about this long. Broccolini has actually been made as a cross between gailan, which is if you've ever been to dim sum, um, another name for it is Chinese broccoli. And it's a real leafy vegetable with a tiny little head. So they took that gailan and they crossed it with broccoli and they got broccolini. So the whole stem is edible. It's nice and tasty and soft, but a lot of times people don't know that the stems of this guy are also edible. So a lot of times, you know, this is a broccoli crown where they've just taken the top off, but if you ever buy, buy broccoli and it's got that long stalk on it, that's actually edible. You can cut it off, peel it real good. It's got a nice thick peel on it, and then you're gonna uh, chop it into little sticks and you can saute it or use it in a crudite, like a fresh veggie tray, um, dip it in ranch or whatever kind of hummus, stuff like that. It goes really, really great with that. So um, these are all incredibly tasty. So along with the, uh, the idea of the fractal that we were talking about before, this also has a fractal pattern. So if you look very closely, each, it's kind of hard to see. You'll have to see, it's very bright. But next time you're in the grocery store, if you look, each one of these looks like a little head of cauliflower. So it's the same fractal pattern that you see 
here. The thing that all of these have in common um, is that they're actually edible flowers. They're flower buds. So if you let these grow out completely, um, you, you'll, you'll find that this head will start to form uh, inside of this big leafy, um, it's, it looks like a collard plant basically because it's, it's related to collards. Uh, and um, it will grow and if you don't cut this off while it's still a flower bud, these will start to stretch out and then little stalks will come out and you will get these beautiful four petaled bright yellow flowers that come out of it. But at that point, the broccoli is no longer edible. I mean, you could eat it, but it's kind of woody. It doesn't really taste very good. So just keep that in mind. If you are gonna grow broccoli, um, then you're gonna grow it and cut it off when it gets to here. Once you cut this off, you are gonna get other little stalks of broccoli, like little small heads that come off of the side, like little short guys, they'll look like that kind of. Um, and those are all completely edible. Another thing that people don't know is that these flower buds, their leaves are edible. So um, if you grow any of these plants in your garden, um, the leaves, you can break the leaves off and cook them just like collard greens. So this, this is the European brassicas. These are European brassicas and they include cabbage, collard greens, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, uh, kohlrabi, um, lots and lots of anything that like when you break it and it gives you this kind of sulf sulfurous smell is a brassica. It's just whether or not um, there's a big diversity in brassicas because the mustards and a lot of those developed in Asia. Um, but we can get into that family at another time. But I just wanted to bring the flowers to you, the edible flowers to you today. Um, a lot of people don't know these are flowers, even though this is called cauliflower. A lot of times I'll test people and say, what part of the plant is this? And they're like, uh, I don't know, is it the stem? Is it the leaf? It's like, no, it's the cauliflower. So um, very, very delicious. Uh, all of these plants in that family, in the cabbage family, contain, um, a chemical, they're a chemical class called glucosinolates. Uh, you won't be tested on that information, um, but they are the things that give broccoli and cauliflower the smell. Um, there's a bitterness to this family of vegetables, the cabbage family of vegetables, but it's a genetic, it's genetic whether or not you can taste it. So uh, if you have two parents that could both taste, um, chances are the child will most likely be able to taste the bitter chemicals in here. There's actually a piece of uh, indicator paper, a little bottle of it that you can buy for science classes. And um, if you pass them through a classroom, everybody will taste it. And some people will taste a little bit of bitterness. Some people won't taste anything at all. It will just be like licking on blank paper. And then other people, they taste it and they're like, oh, and those are the super tasters. So this, is my public servant and service announcement today for you parents out there, never force feed your kid a vegetable. It will scar them for life, especially if they're in this class of vegetables. So I did taste that paper at one point in a science class long ago, and uh, I'm actually a taster, not a super taster, but a taster. So I actually like the bitterness um, in these vegetables. I think they taste delicious. As Americans, we're trained more to um, go towards sweet and protein taste and umami, which is uh, savory. Um, but we are not really trained from a young age to eat spicy things or bitter things. And so this is a kind of a little form of bitter that we can get into our diets for the more of the complexity of flavor. Um, in that class of uh, chemicals, the glucosinolates, uh, there's isothiocyanates and sulforaphanes. So they also contribute to the pungent flavor. And there is some research, some basic and preliminary research that's going on with um, that, for, that class of chemicals. Um, there was some preliminary research done around 2014 and ongoing with uh, these chemicals effect on cancer and uh, dementia. But um, there's not enough evidence at this point um, to say that they would influence it um, one way or another, but they're delicious, so you should eat them anyway. Um, and who knows, when science catches up with us um, and we're eating a bunch of these, um, it, you know, it couldn't hurt, so give it a try. Uh, but never force your kids to eat something that they don't like. If you would like to introduce a new food to them, cook it, 
it's a great idea to serve it with cheese on it. And you put this food in front of them first when they're hungry and you don't put the rest of the food down first. So they start to get a taste for this. And when you're feeding your baby, um, when you start to give them solid foods um, in between six months and a year and you're introducing new foods one at a time, you can cook this um, or this and grind it up uh, and in a food processor and mix it with other things so they can start to get a little bit of taste for the bitter in these vegetables. Um, it's a great thing to get into, into kids' diets because the more tastes that they have younger in life, uh, the more diversity of a palate they're gonna have when they're older. Plus they'll also have a taste for fresh food. Um, there's a lot of kids who grow up on a lot of processed food and they just don't have the capacity to eat vegetables and they really kind of need to be trained to do it. So the earlier you start, the better off you'll be. So, um, so those are my little brassicas. Uh, right now is the time that you, if you're in the Piedmont of North Carolina, you're gonna be putting these guys in right now. So um, you're gonna put starts in little plants right now. You could uh, seed them, but it may not form a head by the time that frost comes. So, um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about this guy. He's a white uh, flower bud, okay? And the way to keep these white, they don't naturally come this way. They actually will either turn um, a, like a red purple or they'll turn a green or sometimes an orange if you leave them open and this forms in the sunlight. Sometimes they'll just turn kind of a light yellow. Um, in order to get this blanched white like this, as the big leaves grow up around it and the, the head is really small, you're gonna take the leaves, fold them over the head and put a rubber band on them and you'll get this nice, beautiful white cauliflower. Um, because the light isn't hitting it, it keeps it from photosynthesizing and developing its chlorophyll, which is green, or carotenoids, which are orange or yellow, um, or uh, anthocyanins, which are the purple. Uh, that's how, that's the, the, the purple cabbage, that's an anth anthocyanin. Uh, the blue and blueberries, that's an anthocyanin. And so to prevent that from being, to, to get the white, beautiful white, bright uh, snowball cauliflower, you cover up the head. Um, you'll often see this if you go into fancy stores, you'll see the beautiful like purple cauliflower and it's, it's really, really gorgeous. Um, plus you get those nice uh, pigments that are phytonutrients um, that are actually very, very good for you. The pigments in vegetables, they're not, they're not um, vitamins and minerals, but they have their own antioxidant effects. And some of them are coenzymes in our biological processes. So that's why you'll hear the term um, in a lot of nutrition promotions, eat a rainbow, uh, because it isn't it's not just the vitamins and minerals, it's all of this other kind of new research uh, supporting um, that, that these chemicals actually support our health. So preventative health, keep you healthy rather than you know, protect you from being sick. And that is very important these days. So, okay, so these are my little, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to tell you about that. Oh, uh, let's talk about how to cook these really quick. So uh, a nice little latchkey thing you can do, latchkey kids, if they go home, the easiest way to get them to cook this, if you get them like, I, I love this, I've, I've been cooking uh, these kinds of vegetables this way for a long time, um, because it doesn't take a lot, it does take knife skills. So a kid can come home, or an adult, and break these off. See my little fractal pattern? Uh, you can break these off. So the kids don't require to use knives. And then you put these in a glass bowl. Don't microwave plastic, it's not good for you. Um, you put these in a glass bowl and then slide a glass plate over the top. You can put a little bit of water underneath in the bowl if you want to. And then if you want a little handful of cheese on top. Uh, and then stick it in the microwave for three to five minutes. Uh, just be really careful when you take it out of the microwave because it can be pretty hot. So you probably don't like a middle school or a teenager doing this, not a little kid. Uh, and then these will be nice and soft and you'll have cheesy, um, really delicious cheesy uh, uh, brassicas to eat. Um, you can cook all of them this way. And that's really nice, especially if you have little kids and you don't wanna put, you know, you're running around after them and you're gonna make their baby food. You can throw something in the microwave and leave it in there. Whereas if you left it on the stove, uh, it, you know, you could start a fire. So it's kind of nice to cook in the microwave sometimes because it's just quick. Just again, no microwaving plastic. Plasticizers come out of there and you end up consuming them, which is not good for you. So no more microwaving plastic if you're doing it. 
Uh, so another great way to do it is uh, you can blanch these. So I don't like eating these raw. Some people love raw broccoli, love raw cauliflower. But if I'm doing a vegetable crudite, which is like a big fresh vegetable like display, um, I'll break these little trees off like this. And then I bring salted water, like really salty seawater type salty salinity um, to a, a boil, um, bring it to a rolling boil, and then you're gonna drop these guys in for one minute. And then you pull them out and they're bright, beautiful green. They're a little bit softened um, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they still have the crisp on the inside, but they're not so rubbery and squeaky to eat. Um, I don't really enjoy these raw, but some people love it. So either way. Um, another way that I like to cook broccoli, cauliflower, and romanesca is braising. So I'll put a little bit of broth in, um, in a pan and uh, let it come to a boil and then drop these in and kind of steam them. But there's a small amount of uh, liquid in there, so it ends up evaporating and then it kind of sautés a little. And then I finish with extra virgin olive oil, a little fresh chopped garlic, salt, pepper, and lemon, and it's the most delicious awesome way. I do kale that way. Anything in this family, um, I'll, I eat that way and it's, it's really delicious. So, and then a multitude of other things, you know, do a web search to find a million recipes for it. Um, I just don't like these boiled. Boiled, like boiled, boiled until they're soft. Mm. It's, it's much better to steam them because you're not going to lose a lot of the nutrients in the water. If you're boiling your vegetables until they're soft and you're not drinking the the liquid, um, you're kind of losing a lot of the goodness. Uh, here in the South, because I just moved to the South about five years ago, my favorite part when you go in to get collard greens, Southern collard greens, is the pot liquor, that like broth that it's been stewing in. So when I ask for my collard greens, I want my greens in a bowl, more like soup, where there's, there's a lot more broth in there. So that's how I enjoy them. Okay, so we're going to switch gears here for a second, because I promised you after last week, we would start doing a chili of the week. So for those of you that were with us last week, um, we talked about chilies, where they originated and how they've spread across the world to provide this beautiful um, you know, diversity of foods for our diet. So uh, the one that we, we talked about the, uh, the original chili and then the hottest pepper in the world. Well, this one is the longest pepper in the world. I accidentally broke it, so. Because uh, I was so excited and I was playing with it before we got on the Zoom and I broke it. Anyway, this is a very hot pepper, so I'm going to have to wash my hands. But this thing can get over a foot long, and it's called a Thunder Mountain Longhorn. So this is actually a chili that was developed in China. And the area, the mountains around this valley where this was developed, um, translated, the, the name is Li Gong Shan, and that, that means Thunder Mountain. So when these were, or mountains of thunder, that's what that means. And so when these were developed and then the seeds were um, spread all over the world in uh, heirloom um, seed companies, uh, it became the Thunder Mountain Longhorn. So this is about uh, between 20,000 and 40,000 Scoville units. And to compare, uh, a jalapeno is uh, about anywhere from 2,000 to 8,000, so like call it 5,000. You know, sometimes you can get a really, really hot jalapeno, and other times you can get um, just a nice kind of mild jalapeno. As a side note, one of my friends brought me some, uh, I think they were Armenian chilies last week, and she cannot eat spicy food. So <laughs> she brought these to me, and she had been roasting them and eating them, and she said, oh, they're so mild, they're, you know, they say one in like 20 of them are hot. And I took this pepper and I just bit the end off of it. And I got one of the really, really hot ones. So I immediately started crying. There's like, you know, not crying sad, but just tears are just coming out of my eyes. I'm like, you know, getting my mask wet. It was, it was a mess. Um, so be very careful about that. Uh, make sure that you have water or milk around um, if you're just gonna go willy-nilly biting on chilies. But I got a really hot one. And she's uh, one of my Irish friends and she does not do spicy food. Like Tabasco is too hot for her. So uh, I, was, I was the lucky one. Uh, anyway, so these are super interesting and super fun. If you're going to grow um, heirloom chilies like this, you're gonna start them early, um, maybe February inside. Uh, these are very expensive seeds. Any of these heirloom type seeds that they, you'll get about 10 seeds in a packet and that packet can be anywhere from three to $5. So plant them as little starts 
And uh, that way, if you don't get a good germination rate, you can call the company and they'll send you some more seeds. Because if you're paying 50 cents a seed, you know, and one seed makes a big plant, you want to make sure that you're getting what you pay for. Um, so these are open pollinated, so you can actually save the seeds from these and they'll come back true, which means that um, you plant them and you'll get the same pepper. Whereas, uh, you know, if you have uh, cucumbers and melons in the same field, musk melons like a cantaloupe, um, they'll cross pollinate. And if you plant those seeds, you'll end up with a cucumber melon. It's a little bit weird. Uh, I've had that before. It's, it's kind of strange. Uh, so yeah, Thunder Mountain, Mountain Longhorn. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. If anybody has any uh, questions, comments, tell me about it. Okay, great. Um, so I tried to answer this in the chat, but our first question was, which, which of the things that you showed are from the Briggs Garden? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear you because my speaker's a little messy. Oh, sorry. So which of the items that you showed us today were grown in the Briggs Community Garden? Oh, the things that are from Briggs Garden? Definitely this guy. So these are all going into the ground right now. So obviously these are coming from like California or probably actually not. They're probably not coming from California now because it's real hot in California right now, as we all know. Um, pray for them. Things are burning. Uh, but these are actually probably coming from somewhere up north, like New York or um, somewhere where it's colder right now because these really grow in cooler weather. So um, so yeah, these are not growing at breaks. I mean, they're growing at breaks, but they're this big. They're <laughs> and we actually right now, for those of my breaks gardeners that are on this call, we have a woodchuck in the garden and we got to trap him because he went over any munch some of our starts. I knew right away when I saw it, I'm like, it's a woodchuck. So, um, so yeah, we're, we put the have a heart traps out for him and we'll relocate him. Um, but yeah, um, no, but the, the, the chilies right now, because we planted those in the summer, and they've grown all summer. Now we've just got, I mean, if you like hot chilies and you're in town, come visit me because we've got just so many varieties right now and they're all just popping off. We cannot harvest them fast enough, so. Um, I hope you get a picture of that woodchuck whenever you catch it so I can see how cute it is. <laughs> uh, so our next question is, do you do your own starts for brassicas for Briggs? I do. I do. Uh, we, uh, I started about 40 trays of them, not only for Briggs, but also our child 4-H victory gardens, and then also the sort of uh, adult ad hoc victory gardens. We did about 100 of those in the spring, so I'm having a lot of those families contact me for plants. It was really brutally hot until this week, so my starts didn't do as well, um, but in another couple of weeks, they'll be gorgeous and beautiful and um, but yes, we have a greenhouse, and so normally we, we try to grow in it. It's brand new. We just got it last year, um, and they're actually installing a greenhouse cooler for us. So next summer, I can grow them in a greenhouse rather than having a miniature plant nursery right outside my front door. I have to do that because life is so busy. I don't want to forget them. So anytime I walk outside, I can look at all of them and make sure that they're doing well. But it was so hot that even when they came up, they just were not happy because these guys like cool weather. So, um, so that's why I, you know, they don't look as good as some of the ones in the store, but they will make food. And when they get a couple of weeks to recover from the blistering heat. <laughs> and another question, are you still taking veg donations? Am I still taking veg directions? Donations. Oh, veg donations. Vegetable donations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do my, I do uh, box food deliveries on, we do, we do all the harvests on Friday and then uh, I do the box, uh, we make boxes and deliver them on Saturday. Um, those are for our people that either uh, can't leave because of COVID or uh, they, um, you know, can't leave for some reason or they don't have a car or something, we'll deliver to their house. Uh, but then um, I also put a lot of food in the refrigerator there so that the Durham Technical uh, Community College uh, Food Pantry can pick up food once or twice a week there for their food distributions to go on uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. So yes, if you've got, whether it's 10 green beans or a truckload of potatoes, I'll take it, you know, or a can of tuna. Um, canned proteins are always a big thing for them. But right now, if you have an extremely bountiful harvest, bring it on by because um, our, the, the, the produce, the fresh food that we grow for them goes like real fast. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you very much for offering that, Wanda. Um, and then we had another question. If you could repeat what you said about how to assess or measure how hot peppers are and what is the term you used? 
Um, so, okay, so chemically speaking, uh, originally they used to do the Scoville scale, um, and that uh, is Wilbur Scoville, and he is a pharmacist, and he used to take a pepper, uh, grind it up um, in uh, water or saline or something, and divide it up and, and give it to five people for them to objectively assess what, how hot it was. Um, but now the way that they do it so that it's more accurate is they actually do high pressure liquid chromatography. So it's basically where you take that, you know, you uh, dissolve some of the caps capsaicin in the pepper and then you uh, put it in a uh, syringe and you inject it into a machine and the liquid chromatography, it's this, we won't go into it, but basically it separates the factors and it'll tell you by a spike how much uh, capsicum something has and that is actually quantitative I mean qualitative quantitative rather than qualitative data so it's much more accurate awesome I was writing that down so I don't forget um, <laughs> so another question we have come in is um, about the flowers that you were talking about earlier so um, we know that usually flowering plants take a lot of sun um, or need more sun to grow. Do these plants also need more sun to grow even though they're kind of fall crops? So these guys, um, you know, just like any vegetable garden that you're gonna have, it really does need between six and eight hours of sunlight a day. Um, and so if you have an area that gets morning sun and then it's shaded in the afternoon, that's actually ideal uh, rather than having, you know, where it's cool all morning in the shade and then roasts in the sun in the afternoon in the summer. So, but either way you can make it work. Um, you definitely can't grow these in the shade. That being said, um, the cooler, the cold crops, the things that like to grow in the spring and the fall, and you can also overwinter a lot of things here in North Carolina, they don't require as much sunlight as making a fruit. So things the things that grow primarily an easy way to remember it is the things that grow in the uh spring and fall are roots shoots leaves and flowers like the edible stuff like this whereas in the summer it's mostly fruits so things like things with a seed on the inside um they're not vegetables because they're not the vegetative part of the plant this is a vegetative part of a plant but something with the seed inside is a fruit so squash peppers, eggplant, um, you know, you name it, even corn, like uh, even uh, the winter squashes don't grow in the winter. We store them over winter, which is why we call them winter squashes. But those, we, in order for a plant to make a fruit, it requires a lot of sunlight because sunlight and air is what the plant uses to make starch. It captures sunlight and air, turns carbon dioxide, what we breathe out, into starch. It mixes with water. It's so amazing. And so it needs a lot more sunlight to do that. You don't need as much sunlight for these guys. So, but you do need cooler weather. Very good. Well, I think we are out of questions and out of time. So I thank you again, Sherilyn. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming this week. Um, I'm excited for next week to see. I know what chili I'm going to choose, um, and I have an idea about what we're going to do from the grocery store, but I never know. I walk in and I see what looks good for y'all. I said, great. We look forward to it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you next week.